So hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Sachin Kumar and uh, this tutorial will be presented by Vidisha and I. Um, both of us are PhD students at CMU uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we're working with Professor Yulia Swatkov. Um, we're coming to you live from Seattle at five in the morning. So if we appear groggy or you know say something stupid, please forgive us. Um, so Yulia played a huge part in designing this tutorial, but due to you know, time zone issues, she won't be able to join us in the session. Um, but Vidisha and I will, in the next 90 minutes, I will try to cover most recent developments in large language models. Uh, we'll primarily focus on the societal harms um, deploying such models uh, can perpetuate and we'll primarily focus on uh, language generation as a case study, as it is one of the most common end user cases um, with large language models. Um, and before we begin, I would like to make this disclaimer that since we'll talk about societal harms, uh, some of our slides might contain examples of um, often generated by these language models, which can be offensive or toxic or contain, you know, certain kinds of discrimination, discriminatory text. Okay, so let's start uh, with what are language models. Um, so say if I give you these sentences uh, and ask you to rank them on the basis of how grammatical or how fluent they are, um, all of us familiar with basic English grammar uh, would be able to do that. Um, and to emulate such a system, a language model is designed to measure how probable a piece of text is. So we have a sequence of words or tokens, Y1 to Yn, and we want to find the probability of the sequence. Um, and since this distribution is defined over N variables, we can use the chain rule to factorize it into N components. And each component basically measures the probability of the next token. Um, given the context. And since we are creating a probability distribution, we can also sample from this distribution um, and generate text sequences instead of just measuring uh, its probability. And based on the simple idea, using modern architectures like transformers, um, training them with huge amounts of text data available on the web, they're often referred to as large language models these days, uh, but the basic principle remains the same based on some context uh, predict its continuation. Um, there are other forms of the same objective involving various forms of mass language models uh, that, has, that have also been studied. Uh, since they're not easily conducive to generation, we'll talk mostly about what these days are referred to as causal language models or autoregressive language models. Um, uh, and we'll, like I said, we'll mostly focus on text generation because you know these are end user focused applications. Um, and for the purpose of text generation, uh, the basic pipeline of how a language model works is like is like this. We like first look for some textual data to train this language model on. Um, this can be, for example, digitized books, news articles, Wikipedia, or text from social media, scientific articles, and so on. Um, we then define a language model architecture, um, uh, like, for example, or in, in early days of language model, they used to be based on n-grams, or in more recent days, based on like LSTMs, uh, and most modern uh, large language models um, are based on architectures called transformers. Um, we uh, then can define a loss function to train this model by maximizing, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the likelihood of the training data and obtain a trained model, P of Y. And once these models are trained, you could distribute them, for example, via an API such as uh, GPT-3 does uh, these days. And you could use them in your applications based on different decoding strategies, um, based on whatever you require, um, the kind of user required out of them. And just to establish some scale, in the past few years, these models have exploded in size, uh, going from a few million parameters uh, around only five to six years ago to hundreds of billions now um, with many 
models released this year, which I've not shown in this slide, containing up to half a trillion parameters. Um, now, this trend of increasing the model size continues because model performance keeps on improving. Uh, these, these models have shown like outstanding performance improvements on many, many benchmark tasks uh, in the field of NLP in, in many languages, both for uh, understanding tasks like classification, entailment, question answering, and so on, as well as um, language generation tasks, such as translation, summarization, dialogue generation, and even many open-ended tasks, such as generating stories, given a short input, um, also called a prompt, um, producing extremely fluent text, uh, almost indistinguishable for hum from humans in many cases. Um, as an example, given an input um, such as this in this slide, uh, GPT-3 generates um, a fun and imaginative story or unicorns in this, in this example. Um, now with the success, uh, these models are already a part of or will be a part of many applications in the near future, such as chatbots or dialogue systems, machine translation systems, new summarization systems, and even writing assistants, um, which include but are not limited to applications such as autocomplete, which help uh, a person not, for example, fluent in English, help write uh, long articles in English or other languages. Um, in the past couple of years, uh, we can already see an increased interest in this field um, from the general public and, and practitioners uh, with many user-facing apps building um, Twitter bots or chat bots using these models and common apps like Google Docs or Gmail, which most of us use, um, adding autocomplete in their editors, which um, to some extent rely on these models. But um, many of the, oh, sorry about the animation issue, but many of these models um, are trained on unfiltered data from the web um, written by humans. So it also reflects um, and amplifies issues in those text, um, reinforcing many biases, um, generating toxic and abusive language, text demeaning different subpopulations based on gender, race, and so on. Um, or even hallucinating information that does not exist, um, and also posing threat to individual privacy um, by revealing their personal information. Okay, so with that background in this tutorial, um, we'll talk about three things. First, we'll um, talk about ethical concerns in language generation tasks. Uh, covering topics like fairness, toxicity, misinformation, and privacy. Um, in the second part, uh, we'll go over some recent studies, including some of our own work, which study how to detect, visualize, and analyze uh, these problematic behaviors in generated text. And finally, uh, we'll discuss recent work in the community taking steps to mitigate these harms, uh, ranging from methods to filter the training data itself, uh, to making use of detection algorithms to modify model behavior or decoding algorithms uh, and methods to post-process the generated text. Now, most of the content in this tutorial will be um, focused around toxicity and bias uh, and misinformation with respect to language generation systems, like I said. Um, and there are many other issues and concerns in, that the community has studied, both with respect to generation and other NLP tasks pertaining to language models, uh, but we consider them out of scope for the purpose of this short tutorial. Um, and we want to make this as interactive as possible, uh, so please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat or um, uh, raising your hand and we'll try to answer them as we go. Okay, so net, now let's start with the overview of the potential harms, and uh, I'll try to highlight the ones that we'll discuss in more detail um, later on. Okay, so say um, you have a language model like GPT-3, for example, um, and you want to deploy this fluent language model in a product, say a chatbot, um, which many people will use. Um, we, of course, would like it to be civil 
and not spew slurs, racism or anti-Semitism or any kind of other discriminatory stuff. Um, however, a lot of recent studies have highlighted that even with innocuous looking in inputs, uh, there is a high probability of observing toxic outputs containing problematic behavior. Um, and for example, a recent study has highlighted um, that GPT-3 is 87 percent likely to generate at least one toxic output every 25 generations and the probability of generating something toxic or hateful increases as you keep on generating from these models um, and this bias is not limited to overly toxic behavior um, but it's also presented um, in, in other subtle ways um, for example um, in forms of sexism where um, if you give it a prompt uh, such as the man worked as, uh, the, the jobs that it produces um, are like salesmen versus if, if the input contain, contains the word women, um, it, it uh, produces words like prostitutes um, and similar behaviors are observed um, against different races and different sexualities and so on. Um, and um, these models, uh, prior studies have shown that are known to um, have bias against different minority populations uh, and generating words related to lower prestige jobs um, against these marginalized, um, marginalized populations. And on the other hand, um, despite being, being highly fluent, and being shown to be useful, the task that like story generation, which requires a certain imagination, um, even when used in other contexts, these models are prone uh, to generating non-factual outputs and are capable of hallucinating and generating conspiracy theories about many topics like 9-11 or climate change, for example. Um, and this behavior has been shown to become worse um, in larger models. In fact, uh, past work from Zellers et al. has shown that they can be maliciously used to generate fake news and propaganda. For example, uh, this anti-vaxxer article in this image, uh, where, they've, where um, they, these models have been shown uh, to dupe humans. Um, uh, a, a lot of studies have shown that humans find the articles generated by these models quite plausible. Um, and this, this problem is not limited to open-ended tasks, uh, you know, like, new, like news article generation or where you give a headline and generate news, but it's also uh, has been shown in tasks like news summarization, where the task is you are given an article and uh, the goal is to summarize whatever is in the article. And instead of reflecting the facts of the article, the outputs uh, are often misinterpreted um, and presented in a misleading way by these models. For example, this recent state-of-the-art uh, model trained on a language model called BART generates uh, almost 75% factually incorrect and misleading summaries um, from the test data. And finally, um, I also want to touch on privacy issues, although we won't cover them in, in much detail in the rest of the tutorial. Um, a lot of data on which these models uh, are trained might contain personal information, otherwise not that easily accessible. Um, and it has been shown in prior work that these language models memorize some of this information. And given the right kind of input or prompting, uh, can leak this information, um, including uh, some very sensitive information like uh, your social security number, your phone numbers, and addresses. Um, including a list of a lot of other things mentioned in this table. Okay, so um, one might wonder um, why all of these issues are caused. Um, while, while we'll delve into a lot of the details later, um, the short answer is that, like I had mentioned in the beginning, uh, the language models are designed and trained to model the probability distribution of text or how probable or how fluent uh, something is, um, conditional or some input or not. 
but they're used they're being used in many many social situations um, for which they're not intentionally designed for um, and second because is the training data now uh, a lot of the data used to train these models these days are is collected from the web um, and a lot of toxicity and discrimination exists on the web um, and this kind of uh, problematic behaviors get amplified and reinforced in these language models. And finally, um, in most cases, uh, language models trained once on some data are never updated. Um, so this limits uh, this limits uh, the language models to adapt to more knowledge, you know, that is getting added to the world. Um, which might lead to errors presenting um, the facts. So something that's true today might not be true five years later. And if a language model is trained today, uh, you may not be able to use it five years into the future. Um, and a lot of uh, mitigating strategies uh, that we'll discuss uh, in part three are designed to fix these issues that we just discussed. Uh, but before we delve into those details, I'll pass it over to Vidisha, um, who will discuss methods to detect and analyze these issues first. Um, and uh, while we make this transition, um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Vidisha, all yours. Thank you. Um, sharing my screen. Yeah, can you see the slides? Sounds good. Um, so yeah, we now introduced a set of like what kind of social harms these language models perpetuate. And now in part two, we're going to introduce two, three tasks like toxicity detection, uh, factuality detection. And using these tasks, we want to introduce tools which can be used for both detecting and analyzing these kind of social harms that exist. These are useful for both using these methods to mitigate, to avoid such harms from reaching users and also for practitioners to study and analyze these models and understand what kinds of problems they're building. The, we begin with studying the inadvertent effects of language models generating toxic text. Many applications like chatbots require users to interact with language models and consume text produced by them. When building such applications, practitioners need to be mindful that the text reached of the users is not toxic or offensive. Therefore, we need to we need tools to study and detect such toxicity to eliminate such content from language models and from reaching these users. Now, hate speech and toxicity has many shades and show up in various forms like aggressive text, harassment, and text offensive to different groups of people. And due to its varied variation in types, it's challenging to have a one single definition for toxicity. It's a slippery, hard to define concept, but there are many definitions sort of presented by the community. So let's focus on several of them. And depending on the application or the practitioner, one can use one or more of these definitions. Um, initially, you could sort of think of defining toxic text based on who it targets. As in, if a text disparages people of a certain race, a color, or religion, we can consider this text to be toxic. You could also think of it as something that is harmful in its intent. If the text was intended to express hatred against someone or to insult or humiliate someone, we could consider this text as toxic. Um, another way to look at it is by the effect the text has on the person or the situation. For example, toxic text could be threatening or could lead to violence against someone or some group of people. Um, and finally, you could also look at the cause behind some harmful content. 
if an offensive text is motivated by a person, or in our case, the model's bias against a group of people, we can consider it toxic. So when we discuss what is hate speech or toxic text, there are many aspects to think about. Who are the people involved? What is the model's bias involved? Are there minority or people groups? What is the purpose? Is it intentional or inadvertent? And this is only to understand whether a text is toxic or not. Once you do identify a text as toxic, there's a whole new layer of questions. What do we do with it? What kind of policies are there? Who is responsible and how to deal with models generating toxic text? To build toxicity classifiers and detectors, we need data for training computational models. But obtaining data containing hate speech and toxic text is not easy to obtain them. News outlets and social media platforms, which own their content, often filter content that they are So using text from them don't often represent real data and additionally introduce biases, biases from the companies and their filtering policies. Privacy, privacy issues like uh, privacy issues also restrict researchers from collecting corpora. Uh, like the terms of conditions of the platform, privacy laws like GDPR do not allow you to collect data with personal info, and toxic texts often have sensitive information about the offender or the addressee, and collecting such text, toxic text without this private information keeping in is hard. Finally, um, exposing toxic text to annotators for them to label is tough, is damaging for the people involved. Um, reading hate speech and derogatory text can be harmful for their mental and emotional well-being, making obtaining such annotations difficult. So we now discussed how to define toxicity and the, the fact that defining toxicity itself is pretty hard it, because it shows up in various shapes, shapes and definitions. And collecting annotated data for training toxicity detectors is also challenging due to the biases of the data involved and the privacy issues. So the research community has focused on building targeted detectors focused on specific shades of toxicity. So focus on one kind of toxicity, one particular type, and collect data regarding NLD. And building a single solution, a single detector that works for all shades of toxicity is still a difficult challenge. These are a small list of growing data sets the community has focused on. Uh, and each of these focus on different shades and some of them in different languages also extended their applicability to a world other than English. All of these data sets focus on toxic text and hate speech produced by humans. While such or while detectors built using these data sets could be used to detect toxic text generated by large language models, they might not work as well since models potentially can have different types of toxic tests and different proportions of different styles as compared to humans. Using these annotated data sets, one can build those toxicity classifiers and you can use any of machine learning models which they in input and classify them as toxic or not. And in practice, this can be instantiated. to the kind of model you use, the kind of architecture you use, can be instantiated in many ways, using either regression models with targeted features or sentiment of the text, regular expressions which identify certain toxic phrase and structures, even more recent neural models and teaching language models like BERT could be used to train such so toxicity detection models using annotated data sets. For practitioners who are looking for existing tools, there are off the shelf tools like Hate Place and Perspective API, which take input text and provide scores to, to highlight which of the text is toxic, what parts of the text are insulting or threatening. These tools can be used by practitioners who are building language model applications to include in their pipeline and highlight problematic outputs. I do wanna highlight that these tools are not yet 100% accurate and might not detect all types of harmful texts yet, but it's a good starting point and practitioners should be aware of the limitations of these tools when integrating it into their applications. <laughs>
there are still a lot of challenges in toxic text detection. Text is often abbreviated and new abuse words are with modified spellings are often created and used to avoid toxicity detectors. Um, multiple subtle forms of toxicity like microaggression, whales, toxic text are still hard for models to detect because they don't use overtly toxic words in their text and they have these subtle flavors of toxicity. Also, different cultures have different definitions and flavors of what is considered to be toxic and racist. Models today don't yet incorporate cultural connotations to be applicable in a wide variety of situations. Um, also, a lot of this research is US centric, and techniques need to be extended and evaluated in other cultural contexts as well. There is also a related issue of racial bias and toxicity detectors. Um, research has found that most of the current toxicity detectors are biased against African American English and English uh, languages and dialects that the training data does not uh, include well. They disproportionately flag text in American, African American English as toxic. Um, toxicity detectors inaccurately pick up on skewed these correlations in the training data, which focus on different racial attributes instead of focusing on the toxic parts of the text. And this is problematic for using such toxicity detectors in real applications. And research is being done to figure out a better solution around this. One potential way to introduce more insight and control into the detector is to make it more interpretable. Our recent research looked into building fine-grained toxicity detectors, which not only classify a text as toxic, but also identify what parts of the text is toxic, which led to that particular prediction. The community has collected an annotated data set to the semi-guard challenge and encouraged building interpretable time frame toxicity detectors. And um, using this data, now we can build toxicity taggers, which reduce finding outputs and highlight what parts of the text is toxic. And it can be potentially useful for practitioners to identify what features the model use for identifying toxic text and can help identify some picture features and biases that the model is incorrectly picking up on and analyze like the model's capabilities, its limitations, etc. So now we've discussed how toxicity can show up in various shades. They can be veiled or they can be overt. So it's challenging for building generalizable models that work with such a lot of shapes. And particularly, data collection for toxicity detection is hard. Uh, toxicity is subjective, there are cultural connotations involved, and privacy issues, which make it difficult to get realistic data around this. And cultural racial biases do exist in toxicity detection and which make it hard to apply these detectors in a wide variety of situations. Um, that said, a lot of this research is being done focuses on toxic text detection based on text generated by humans, especially in social media platforms and different uh, online interactions. We do, there is much less research on focusing on toxic text detection based on machine text the kind of toxicity that language models can produce or language generation, generation systems can produce. So um, more research along that direction is still growing. We now move to study the inadvertent effects of language models producing actually incorrect text. Um, users interacting with these language generation uh, models need to be able to use them reliably, and detecting such non factual content is important. Especially as applications using language models are becoming more widespread, it's essential to study and flag such content. Practitioners need to be mindful that the text reaching the users is reliable for the users. And using summarization as a task to study how to detect factual errors, but again, these techniques can be extended to other applications as well. Depending on the application and the use case, 
we may require different granularities of factual due detection. For example, to flag non factual content and make sure it's not displayed to the user, we may need course classifiers that just flag or classify content as factual or not. But for more explainable and fine grained detections, which could be useful for practitioners, we may want to not just flag what content is non factual, but even identify what part of the text is non factual. And finally, for detailed studies to understand the limits and capabilities of the generator, we may want to also further go ahead and identify what kinds of errors are the models producing. But same as similar to toxicity, um, collecting factual data for, this, for factuality detectors is hard. Factuality is kind of pretty subjective. Different annotators will have different understandings of what is factual knowledge, what is considered as factual, what is not considered as factual, what is common sense. So getting good annotated material is hard. And it's further, it's very, this factuality detection data sets are hard to eliminate, expensive to eliminate. There are multiple kinds of errors and there are multiple models that generate different distributions of errors. So to be able to get a sizable, generalizable data set, it's an expensive process. Um, so the, one of the ways the current community has sort of progressed is to build very safe data sets by identifying a certain kinds of factual errors and modifying um, factually correct sentences with small perturbations to create factually incorrect sentences. So for example, you can take a sentence, snow was predicted later in this weekend and negate it and say snow wasn't predicted later in this weekend to make a corresponding factually incorrect sentence. And using these kind of synthetic data sets, one can build course factuality classifiers, which take in the claim, the document in which this claim needs to be judged, passes to a classifier, which could be any language models or neural networks, and classify it as factual or not. But, but such course classifiers don't, aren't fully sufficient to identify fine-grained errors. And to build fine-grained error factuality detectors, we first need to understand what are the fine-grained errors that models make. Towards that, we first do the typology or a definition of factual errors. In the simplest case, factual errors appear within a single sentence, a single proposition. Uh, but as some of these include multiple sentences, discourse errors connecting different sentences can also creep in. And there are often information in the summary that potentially cannot be verified because they're not there from including details, background knowledge that is not there in the original document. There are multiple different types of these errors. So prior work has looked at um, enumerating or categorizing these different types of errors and defining a categorization of seven different errors that models make. And based on whether these are based on whether the errors are within a single sentence, whether they're discourse markers in a sentence. For example, within a sentence, the entity or the relation in the sentence could be wrong, versus across different factually correct sentences, the discourse markers, like maybe the pronouns connecting two sentences or the discourse temporal sequencing of these sentences could be wrong. So there sort of is a different defined set of like seven categorizations of the kind of errors models can make when generating some of these. And using this categorization, we can now go ahead and understand what kinds of models, what kinds of models make what kinds of errors, you get annotations on where models are going from. And studies have shown that even across a range of models, models make a lot of factual errors in the first case. Um, and even, especially with more abstracted summarization models, models that tend to paraphrase and to rephrase content um, and compress these content often have way more factual errors. 
And if we break it down based on these different categories that is defined, uh, we see that different models have different ranges of proportions of these different factor areas, where some are uh, have a high proportion of generating the wrong entities versus in other models that error is probably not the highest. So it's necessary to build generalizable models and have quality detectors that work across all of these models in a generalizable manner. And it might be difficult to build targeted detectors for each kind of model. So we discussed how course classifiers are not sufficient, they're not generalizable, one, because they're built on heuristic set of errors, they include a practitioner's bias of what kind of errors are important, and they don't generalize often to complex and more subtle errors. Like and we do require building better detectors that focus on a range of these different error types rather than one or two of them. And we want generalizable detectors that work across many of these categories that we spoke about. Um, another related area of research is the area of fact verification. Fact verification systems are built for human written facts and adapt to the style of facts and claims written by humans. But we need tools for identifying factual inconsistencies as making text also, which is what I've described in the previous uh, few slides. The kind of inconsistencies can be different in both settings. And hence, while the research is related, a lot and a lot of learnings can be leveraged across both, the tools need to be sort of specifically adapted for each task. Um, we'll now move to the third kind of task. We previously discussed inadvertent harms of language models in useful applications, in applications where we want language models to interact with users, but we don't want that users to see inaccurate text or toxic text. Alternatively, language models can be misused for intentionally producing misinformation and propaganda. In such cases, we might not be able to completely mitigate such behavior or eliminate malicious use of such language models, but instead we can aim to build tools to help detect or flag such content and study such content. The first step here before even detecting misinformation or propaganda is to identify machines and read the text itself and enable users to understand whether the text they're reading, especially on the internet, is human written or machine generated. In this part, we focus on tools to visualize and detect machine generated text. Now, while fluency is useful for well intentioned use cases, it can be misleading and hence can be misused by malicious users to generate fake news and propaganda. And current language generation systems learn to mimic human text really well and can fool humans into believing machine written propaganda. A recent study has shown that humans tend to trust and find machine written propaganda more plausible and believable than human written propaganda. So machines are successful in being, in keeping in and um, enabling a false sense of trust between human readers. Now there exists a lot of concepts on Turing tests to identify how well does a machine fool a human into thinking it's a human. And while language models haven't completely beaten the Turing text, language models are already being used in human, in, in real world applications to pose as humans and to interact with other, with other humans. Machine text can sort of machine text, machine generated text can differ from human text in two kinds of errors. One is where we call what is called the type one errors, where the machine text is semantic, has semantically not human-like features, where it tends to repeat text, it might not be completely grammatical, it might not be well-formed, well-meaningful sentences. These kind of errors are much easier for humans to detect as, as non-human, because these are kinds of 
uh, things that are these are kinds of texts that humans don't often see from other humans. So um, it's much easier to look and identify these texts by readers. The second type of errors is type two errors, where machines generate really fluent text, but often focus on non-probable entities or events, or even make up entities and events. So very fluent text, but not very plausible text. But so these kind of errors are what humans find or readers find much harder to detect because they look very fluent, they look well formed. So it's much harder to detect that whether this is human or machine learning. One way of um, visualizing, or one of the ways we can sort of attempt this problem is to visualize machines in the details. Uh, GLTR is one such tool where you can look at human written text in machine written text, start visualize the kind of statistics, how they differ, what kinds of words one uses more versus the other uses more, uh, where do the two texts differ. And this gives, this enables human practitioners to have a better sense of what kind of differences exist between machine text and human text. But Visualization is not a scalable approach. This can help users in when you want to compare two specific texts or practitioners to understand how the text is different from uh, human written text. But to be able to sort of um, extend machine text detection in a scalable manner, to be able to flag content written by machines and enable humans to have but, uh, to have flags to understand whether the text we're reading is machine generated, we need more scalable solutions. So we can again look at this course machine text detector, similar to the three similar architectures to what we discussed in the other two sections, where you can build neural models which take in text and classify them as machine text or human written. And to train these models, we have existing very easily obtained data from getting a lot of machine text generated from the different ranges of models and using machine text versus human text to train these kind of machine text detectors. But the it's not a solved problem yet. These kind of course text detectors are not yet generalizable, especially since today we have such a wide range of model architectures and different decoding methods, different model sizes. We have machine text that are generated with a lot of different styles, a lot of different features. And it's currently, we do, it's hard to build machine text detectors that generalize to new kinds of generators between the features. Um, and also recent research has highlighted how humans and machines or models identify different kinds of errors. Humans are good at detecting semantic issues with generated text where uh, it looks where the sentence is probably not well formed. Semantically, it doesn't make sense. Models are better at detecting these low probability made up events, events which models place high probability on. And hence, we might in future research, we might want human model collaboration for better topics to be able to detect both kinds of errors across a wide range of models. So with this, we've introduced three different tasks, a little bit details in how these tasks can be defined, how we can actually use uh, course neural detectors, analysis tools, and, um, and visualization tools to both detect and flag such, such social harms, as well as study such social harms from a practitioner's perspective. Um, I'll now pass it back to Sachin to talk, move into part three, where we discuss uh, how such harms can actually, now that we've detected this or understood and studied this, how can we actually mitigate such harms to manage models? And while we're transitioning, again, if there are any questions, uh, we can definitely take them. All right, thank you, Vidisha.
Okay. You can see my screen, right? Yeah. All right. Do we have any questions? Um, please feel free to type them in the chat. Or, I mean, we're a small audience. You can also unmute yourself and ask if you like. Otherwise, we can move on. <clears throat> Okay, that's um let's move on. Um right. So now we're at uh the final part uh, of the tutorial that's um mitigating, which is the title of the, the tutorial, just mitigating harms of language models. Um uh, but we, before we delve into mitigation strategies, let's do a brief review of what I presented uh, in the very beginning of uh how most language models are trained. Um, so you start with, you know, finding some data, uh, then you design your model architecture, you set the hyperparameters, you define a loss function and obtain a trained model. Um, and once the model is trained, it is deployed um, to be used in different settings and different strategies. Um, and in the second part, we discussed uh, the causes of harms of these language models. Um, and since, since there are many steps involved here um, in this section, we'll look at um, what we call interventions at each of these steps, um, which, which can help reduce the kind of harms we discussed earlier. Um, and during each of the interventions, I will also highlight what kind of specific harms that Vidisha discussed um, that, that can be used to mitigate, um, that these strategies can mitigate. Um, let's start with data collection. Um, so like I've repeated several times by now, but with Vidish and I, uh, most language models are trained from data collected from the web, uh, which include sources uh, like news articles and Wikipedia, but also social media like Twitter, Reddit, and so on. Um, and uh, a lot of this data may include harmful views such as racism, sexism, um, hate speech, abusive language, and other forms of toxicity. And models uh, trained using such data reflect and amplify these views. Um, so a simple solution that we could think of is why not just filter the data that contains these harmful views? Um, that is, instead of using the data as is, we can look at each document uh, keep the ones we like and just discard the ones we don't seem su suitable, uh, which, which we do not deem suitable, sorry, and hope that the final model uh, doesn't learn any problematic behavior. Um, now, Priorc has designed this filter in various ways, um, and we'll look at uh, some of them now. So, um, the simplest solution uh, is using certain block lists which contain the words which are clearly inappropriate or unsuitable. So you like um, manually design a list of words which you think could be problematic uh, to be present in the document on which you want to train your language model on. So you take uh, each document in your corpus um, and if it contains any of these unsuitable words, um, you discard the document, else you keep it. Um, but like we have discussed before, like Visha mentioned uh, in her part that uh, not all harmful content is that overt. Um, so some prior work has also looked into using classifiers or detectors, which can be trained to detect more subtle forms of harmful content. Um, but again, like harmful content is of various kinds. Um, these um, detectors are also not perfect. Um, so you say you have a classifier which can predict whether some some document contains harmful content. Uh, so if its probability is high, you just discard the document as you keep it. Um, now, some work, uh, for example, uh, work by Goado have also used language models themselves uh, to detect toxic text. So you first take um, you know the the entire corpus that you have, including all the toxic content it might contain, you train uh, a language model without any filtration, 
and then uh, you take you take a small subset of toxic text and try to measure the probabilities of those documents given that toxic text as input. And if uh, that the probability is high, it means that these toxic these documents may contain correlations with toxic inputs. Uh, so you discard those documents and then you reiterate and retrain the model. Now, um, the goal of all of these filtration methods is to remove some data from the corpus, which can be harmful. Um, another uh, sort of less explored alternative to this um, would be uh, try to balance the distribution by adding more good data. Um, this is um, referred to as counter speech um, in the literature um, and in smaller setups. Prior work has shown uh, that instead of, for example, removing hate speech from the data, if we can find examples denouncing hate speech um, and add it to the data, that balances the distribution and it leads uh, to less. Um, it leads it leads to models which learn less of the harmful uh, information and spew less hate speech. Um, However, um, since finding and generating good data can be challenging, um, this hasn't been adopted in a large scale setting yet, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how it performs compared to data filtration. Um, okay, so we looked at two kinds of uh, data interventions. One is data filtration based on block list or you know, more sophisticated models or data augmentation. Um, and both of them have their pros and cons, like I mentioned. Uh, there, I'll describe them in more uh, detail in the, in the next couple of slides. Um, so like um, we had discussed before, uh, filtration, filters are not perfect. Um, the, describing and detecting toxicity, for example, is really hard. Um, and the filters themselves can have biases and can find a lot of false positives. For example, um, if you look at academic articles, for example, which discuss, discuss uh, sorry, which discuss hate speech, uh, say in a community or in a circle, um, they might contain words uh, which in without context could be referred to as hate speech, but you know, the article is not hate speech itself and those kinds of stuff get filtered if we say use like simple filters like uh, based on block lists or for example rap lyrics are oftentimes contain a lot of curse words which would just get removed um, which the kind of content which 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 one could consider non-standard English um, is just removed because you know the filter is biased against these kinds of um, documents. And there is also a lot of um, harmful text which is subtly uh, written, um, which might not be as explicit. Um, and those kinds of contents are not picked up by these filters. Um, and third, um, a lot of, uh, as a result of false positives, um, the, the data distribution that you get after filtration is skewed against minority voices. So in the first part, I briefly mentioned how language models are biased against many minority populations. Um, and uh, for example, against women or um, LGBT populations. And this kind of filtration uh, can lead to further harm. So if you remove um, articles containing, for example, African-American English or Hispanic English, because they're considered low quality. Um, uh, language models trained on this filtered data will be even more biased against these populations. So instead of um, you know, removing the problem, we are exacerbating them if they're using these kinds of filtration techniques. And second, uh, which is more of a practical issue, is that these models uh, are trained with huge amounts of resources. Uh, for example, the largest GPT-3 that's um, for which APIs are available is estimated to cost around 12 million US dollars. Um, while a lot of these uh, industry-based labs are, are uh, focused on improving issues using data filtration mechanisms, among others, um, many practitioners would like to use these models 
um, and do not have the kinds of resources to retrain GPT-3, for example. Um, so, you know, like data filtration may not work for everyone. And third, uh, like we've discussed before, um, um, data filtration is not the only source of issue. So um, language models, like we said, do hallucinate information a lot of times. And um, even with clean data, they have known to show this, this kind of behavior. So filtering data is not going to help in cases like factuality. Um, and a related problem uh, is where models get outdated since they're trained once and fixed, um, but several pieces of information they encode become false as a result. Okay. So, you know, to summarize, uh, we discussed uh, different kinds of data filtration or augmentation mechanisms, um, but, you know, due to biases in these filters, due to the cost of the retraining, and, um, and of course, data not being only one of these issues, intervening only at the data level is not enough to solve these issues. Um, now, I will move on to other kinds of interventions, but before uh, I do that, um, pause there for a second if there are any questions. Okay, um, I don't see any questions, so I'll move on. Um, now, um, since data interventions are not enough, um, if we go back to this pipeline that I described earlier, there are two more steps involved. Um, and in the next few slides, we'll look at examples of um, modeling interventions, so how you could modify how you model your language model. Um, that's a funny phrase, um, uh, um, to decrease uh, the kinds of harms we discussed. And I should warn that this is a huge space um, uh, with a variety of solutions that have been proposed, um, which of course in the short time we cannot go over all of them. So I will highlight the ones um, which try to solve these issues uh, that data interventions cannot. Um, and also I'll not go into too much detail in most of them, uh, but you're encouraged to look up the citations and um, read those papers if you're interested. Um, so one of the issues that we discussed not solvable by data level interventions is factual inconsistencies. Um, and a line of research that focuses on solving this issue do that by modifying the architecture of the language model. So in most cases, uh, the language models are designed as given some context, say, or prompt, predict the next input. So you know, given the article, predict the summary, or given a prompt, generate a news article, or something like that. Um, and in this particular uh, kind of research, these language models are augmented uh, with, with an additional memory or a knowledge base uh, that they can rely on while generating input. Um, so, you know, given a prompt, these, these um, um, language models look up articles um, which can be relevant to the prompt and then generate a, a continuation based on those, those articles. So this in a way is sort of separating how you model fluency versus what information you store. Um, so they can rely on additional information. So this information, the additional information can be updated with time. Um, so this can help um, both in terms of, you know, um, improving factuality because they have some references to look up to uh, while generating and also make the language models time aware because you can update your knowledge base in with time. It doesn't have to be static as opposed to, um, you know, taking some fixed training data and, pre and training the model and keeping it fixed. Um, but we also discussed that, you know, retraining can be expensive. Um, so, you know, training a whole language model based on um, knowledge augmented language models, which are not perfect by the way, um, can be expensive. So 
prior work has also looked into continuing the training models with good data. So instead of retraining a model on huge amounts of data from scratch, what you can do is take um, an already existing language model and find some data which you consider as not bad or good um, uh, and then continue to train the model on that data. So for example, if say you, 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 you do some tests and you figure that your model is generating toxic outputs um, and what you could do is like take some, collect some non-toxic data and then just continue to train this language model on that non-toxic text um, and hope that you know, unwanted behaviors are suppressed and the model generates good data, most good outputs most of the times. Um, but, you know, collecting and finding good data can also be hard because, you know, a lot of the filters, like I said, have biases in them. Um, so prior work, uh, for example, Instruct GPD this year or late last year has looked into also using human feedback uh, for fine tuning. So this, the, the authors of this paper are the same as um, GPD-3 who have a lot of resources. So they uh, put these uh, models out in the wild and collect human feedback, um, including, for example, if the outputs are toxic and use techniques similar to reinforcement learning to continue to fine tune the language models to improve um, or reduce the effects of um, you know, toxic content that these models can create. But, you know, um, uh, in companies like OpenAI and building GPT-3 can uh, collect human feedback because it is really resource intensive and requires a lot of resources and money. Um, but um, seeking feedback back from humans is again a hard task uh, due to people's biases uh, in judging what is harmful and what is not um, because it's very subjective. Um, and you know, despite the expense part, uh, it is still a hard task. So uh, the final kind of model intervention we'll look at is um, what we refer to as model surgery. So you know, you don't fine tune the model at all, but instead um, you edit the model um, using some predefined criteria. So you find certain connections in your neural network model. Um, that could cause the kind of problematic behavior it is causing and uh, remove those connections or modify those connections, you know, with a, with a predefined manual, manual criteria. For example, um, this work uh, by Geva et al. this year um, shows that deleting certain neurons from the language model um, can reduce toxicity in the outputs. Um, and a similar idea has been applied for factuality as well, um, where, say, instead of training a knowledge augmented language model, which could consume a lot of resources, um, you train a knowledge editor. So you have a language model which you keep fixed, and um, you train a knowledge editor which can potentially modify the outputs, uh, sorry, the parameters of this language model. Um, and this knowledge editor takes much less resources to build. Uh, and this kind of work has been um, studied in under different settings in the, in the cited papers here. Um, I know I'm just glossing over these uh, because it's um, in the limited time that we have, they might be too difficult to explain, um, but um, please feel free to check out um, these citations if you're interested. Okay. So um, in model interventions, we looked at three kinds. Um, there are many more kinds of in interventions on the, model on the modeling level you can make, uh, but um, these are the ones we focus on, uh, which are most important, which we deem most important. Uh, so we looked at knowledge augmented language models or fine tuning the language models or editing the language models. Um, and I'll just pause here for a, few seconds again um, if there are any questions or if um, something is not clear and I can go over it again. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so if we ask ourselves, like if this, uh, if these interventions have any kind of pitfalls, uh, some of it we already discussed, um, and let's formalize them a little bit more. Um, so the first issue that we briefly touched upon is resources. It's expensive to retrain or train these knowledge augmented um, models, and it's not something everyone can afford to do. And second, although say fine tuning helps prevent one particular issue, like reducing toxicity, it is not guaranteed to reduce other kinds of issues. So there are many kinds of um, harms or different kinds of toxicities um, that these models produce. And finding, first of all, finding good data for fine, um, for fine tuning to remove these outputs is hard. And second, you can't find data containing all, like removing all kinds of these issues. Um, and second, whatever data you find, it's been shown that language models overfit um, to that data. So it reduces the utility of these language models. They're not as general as they were when trained on a larger corpus. Um, and finally, with respect to surgery, it is, like I said, it's uh, most of the research done in this space is sort of manually finding these neurons and editing them. Um, so again, um, this is hard to do and very context dependent. And again, if you remove a lot of a lot of uh, connections and neurons um, based on different kinds of arms, it may again reduce the utility of the language models. Because you would not know maybe it is uh, re removing some of the harms which are useful in fluency, uh, although contributing to toxicity or other kinds of issues. So again, um, to summarize, model interventions are not enough um, and they may not help on their own, but they can be combined with data level interventions and some of the interventions we'll look at next to be more useful. Okay, um, so now we have one step left in our pipeline uh, where we could also intervene. Um, so, you know, we don't want to change the data. We don't want to change how the model is trained. We just want to use this model and uh, we want to extract good behavior from this model. We don't want to do anything else. We don't want to change it. Um, so earlier we talked about how these models are trained on data which might contain harmful uh, content, for example, toxicity, hate, or biases, which gets amplified. But the original data also had a lot of good content, which is still, which still the model is trained on. So the assumption that uh, most of the approaches that I'll discuss next uh, make is um, how do we extract that good behavior? Uh, because the model is trained on them and is capable of generating uh, good, um, you know, good outputs, and it does generate good outputs most of the time. So we just need to make sure that it does generate good outputs all of the time. Now, uh, before I dive into decoding interventions, uh, let's do a brief overview of common decoding algorithms. Um, so, say you have this language model. Um, so here I've shown it as an encoder decoder model, which can be used in tasks like translation or summarization, um, but it could also just be a decoder only model like, you know, a GPT-2 or 3, um, because the decoding mechanism stays the same. So here um, we're modeling uh, the distribution or the probability of the next token given some context. So you would decode one token at a time, and at any step, we feed into the context, and at the output, you get this probability distribution over the target vocabulary. Um, so it gives you a value of for or a score for every word in the vocabulary. Now, depending on what the goal of the generation is, you could select the output from this distribution uh, you want. Um, say the goal was to find the most likely output under this distribution. Uh, which is maximizing the probability distribution, uh, sorry, maximizing the probability distribution um, and finding the output which maximizes the distribution, um, which is useful for like tasks like summarization or translation. So given a source, you want to generate an output which maximizes 
the distribution under the source. Um, so you could approximate that, for example, with search algorithms like Beam Search, uh, which have been used widely in the past 20 years. Um, or if the goal was say to sample from this distribution and is as in many open-ended tasks like story generation or dialogue generation, you could sample from this distribution. So at every step, you consider this distribution or the vocabulary as a multinomial and uh, just sample from this multinomial. And there's also many ways you could sample uh, using uh, plain old ancestral sampling or slightly more advanced techniques uh, like top K or nuclear sampling, which have been introduced in the past few years. Um, together, uh, these decoding algorithms are, are referred to as autoregressive decoding, um, since you generate one token at a time and feed it to the next step. Um, now, our goal here in this kind of interventions is to take such an algorithm uh, which generates you know, output text and modify it in such a way that we could control what is being generated and avoid generating you know, problematic text. For example, say if we had an evaluator to say whether an output is toxic or not, how do we use uh, that evaluator to generate non-toxic outputs? Uh, basically, uh, we want additional control over our outputs. And for that reason, the algorithms that I'll discuss in the next couple of slides are referred to as controllable text generation. And uh, this is a phrase you could use to search for these kinds of algorithms. And there have been many that have been proposed in the past few years. Um, and these evaluators, like I said, could be constructed in various ways. You uh, are borrowing from uh, what we should describe in part two. Um, they could be as simple as block lists that I um, uh, respect, uh, that I discuss with respect to data filtration, um, or of course fine tuned classifiers, uh, or any other kind of models. Honestly, um, and depending on the class of these evaluators, different decoding techniques have been proposed in the literature. Um, but before we dive into those techniques, um, a simple solution that's worth noting is. Uh, what's called rejection sampling. Uh, that is like if you have, say, a language model and you want to make sure that the output, say, is non-toxic uh, and you have an evaluator for that. So given an input, you just keep generating outputs and measuring it using the evaluator until uh, you generate something non-toxic and discard the ones that are toxic. Um, so you reject the ones that are, that are toxic. That's why it's called rejection sampling. Um, and this solution is quite simple um, and can work for cases uh, like over toxicity, for example, uh, which is easy to measure and does not happen that frequently. Uh, but, it, but this process quickly starts to fall apart in cases where uh, most of the outputs get rejected. For example, if you have, say, a combination of uh, things you want to avoid and uh, or, or in cases like factuality, um, most of the outputs will get rejected and this, uh, I, this sampling becomes sort of intractable. Um, so the first kind of more sophisticated um, algorithms will look at, will look at uh, work by modifying uh, this distribution over the vocabulary that um, I discussed a couple of slides ago. So um, basically, um, we modify our goal from uh, generating an output given some context uh, to generating an output given some context and a desired property A, um, for example, non-toxicity. So we want to generate the next continuation given, and I also want it to be non-toxic. Um, so if we apply a simple base rule, uh, here we get this formulation. Um, so we sort of separated um, how this, uh, so P A given Y is how the desired property is, is measured and the, the other probability is just our language model for which we have a pre-trained model, which we um, don't need to modify. So. Uh, basically, we can modify the probability at every step using some external evaluator P, P of A, um, which evaluates how the generation is performing so far 
And a very simple realization of the setup uh, is using block lists. So say you have a distribution at step T, uh, you take all the words um, that you don't seem deem suitable. So you could use the same block list as you had in uh, data filtration and then take all the words in the vocabulary that are in that block list and set their probabilities to zero and then renormalize the distribution. Um, so this, this just does not generate the words that you know, are problematic. Um, and the setup can, has been modified um, to also boost certain words, certain good words that you want to generate um, in these cited works. Um, a slightly more complex setup than using heuristics than keywords uh, is using heuristics than keywords and use it um, to improve, for example, factuality and summarization. That work has been done by King et al. Um, so for example, they define a heuristic called a consistency function, which measures how an output text is supported by the input source text. So at every step you increase or decrease the probability of the words based on whether they improve for example, cross attention scores in these language models, uh, the entropy of the sentence and so on. It has been shown to improve factuality and summarization. Um, and this work is very new and very, very recent. Um, and um, more research, of course, is needed in this area. Uh, but this is a very promising initial direction. Um, and taking this idea of modifying distributions even further, some works like Young et al. last year have explored using classifiers to modify probability distribution every step, where you combine the probability of, say, a toxic, toxicity classifier and uh, the language model probability. And uh, whenever the probability of the toxicity classifier becomes high, you demote those words. Um, and similar setups have been uh, used um, with, with language models, uh, with auxiliary language models that can be used to again demote and promote certain kinds of words. Um, I won't go into um, details of those, of course, in interest of time, but um, you're encouraged to check them out. Now, all of these approaches, um, like I mentioned before, are based on auto-regressive decoding, decoding one token at a time, and they have had some success, um, but they only measure the whatever desired property you want in your text only on the context in which it is so far. Uh, so, but but a lot of uh, properties that you want is in the you know the whole whole um, sequence that you've generated. For example, you want the whole sequence to be factual, and factuality is hard to measure in sequences that are generated um, only say half say only half the sequence is generated. You can't really measure and generate the next token uh, based on only this half of context. You need full context to be able to modify uh, what you're generating. Um, so the second kind of more recent um, approach that a lot of um, the community is working on, including some work in our own lab, um, is um, sequence level constraint decoding, uh, also referred to as non-autoregressive constraint decoding. Um, so the goal is still the same. We want to sample from the language model, um, uh, but say we want to improve its factuality or its reduced toxicity. Um, but we want to do this on the entire sequence level. Um, so the basic idea in all of these approaches is, is first combine um, all of these goals that you have into a single function also referred to as an energy function and defining a new distribution on this energy function, which is which looks like this, which is proportional to the exponent of the negative of the energy. So say uh, some sample Y has high probability under this new distribution, that means that it has a low energy. Uh, so the goal in these approaches is to find an output which minimizes the energy of this distribution. Um, now, there are two questions um, that we can ask here. How do we sample from this distribution in a non-autoregressive way? Um, and how do we define this energy? In the interest of time, I will only focus on how do we sample in, in very brief uh, detail. And if there are questions later, we, we can talk about how you know, the energy function is computed too. 
Um, so, you know, we want to sample the entire sequence at once. And uh, the approaches to solve this problem uh, follow um, a, something called iterative refinement, uh, which is also more formally called Monte Carlo sampling. Um, so we, you know, so say you have uh, this prompt and a regular GPT-2 model would generate something which is toxic. Um, so you, what you do is you re-refine this entire sequence in several iterations, such that the energy is minimized and uh, you ultimately get to a sequence which is not toxic and is measured at the sequence level. And how you minimize this energy, there's various ways uh, that have been proposed in the literature, which will I, which uh, a lot of which are cited here, but I will um, not go into detail because they're different for different kinds of approaches. Uh, but the basic idea remains the same that it is you iteratively refine the sequence that you are generating. Um, so, you know, non autoregressive decoding solves several drawbacks of um, autoregressive controlled generation. You know, uh, because you can measure the attribute uh, over the entire sequence and you can combine different, different attributes much more easily in, in, a, in a more principled manner. Um, and these attributes, again, don't, don't have to be distributions because you're not modifying distributions or the vocabulary, they can be arbitrary functions. So it, it gives you more flexibility on the kinds of controls that you want and the kinds of harms that you can reduce. Um, but since you're, uh, since you're uh, refining iteratively, uh, it is much slower than um, autoregressive decoding and much more research is needed in this direction to um, just to make it usable uh, and to be deployable. And again, a lot of these approaches um, rely on computing gradients of uh, your outputs with respect to the energy function. And uh, for a lot of models uh, for which gradients are difficult to compute, this can be um, impossible to do. Um, Okay, so to summarize, we looked at decoding algorithms for both autoregressive settings, which generate left to right, and non autoregressive, which iteratively refine the entire sequence. Um, we discussed pros and cons for both. Um, and apart uh, from these, the issues that I already discussed, there are still some remaining challenges. Um, for example, uh, we want to use any of these techniques for factuality improvements. For example, it's hard to define. Uh, these evaluators that I talked about, um, which can provide some meaningful signal to either um, improve factuality or reduce factuality. But most of the factuality evaluators that exist right now are course classifiers. And like the Bisha discussed, um, it's, you need more fine-grained um, analysis or uh, eva evaluators of factuality to, to, be, uh, to be able to use them in, um, in decoding settings. Second, the evaluators uh, we use, for example, for toxicity have biases of their own, like Vibisha had described also. Um, so uh, like prior studies have shown that after applying these techniques, these algorithms tend to not generate certain dialects. So for example, African-American English, uh, which they were originally able to do. Uh, so they remove certain kinds of languages, which they deem not toxic, but it's actually not. Um, and finally, these techniques um, can also be used to cause harm rather than limit it, since you know, the same algorithm run in a slightly tweaked way could also increase toxicity, for example. So um, it could be used by malicious users to increase harm or, as well. And uh, because of these drawbacks, um, research in this field is very, very much ongoing. Uh, a lot of the work that I talked about was, you know, presented last week uh, or came out last week. Um, and people, including in our own lab, are continuing to work in this direction. All right, so returning to our pipeline, we looked at three kinds of interventions at the data model and decoding level. Um, and there's still one more thing we could do that does not intervene, but generate and then edit the output post facto. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because we have a lot of time, basically. Um, but the basic idea is that you train additional models to transform uh, the outputs that you find problematic into nice ones. And uh, this various kinds of techniques have been proposed both for fixing summarization issues, 
um, and also uh, debiasing outputs or reducing toxicity of the outputs in this space. Um, but, but I encourage everyone to check these out. Um, now, since there are many places to affect change, uh, the question is like, where should I intervene? There, there are so many steps and so many intervention, so many ways to do interventions. Um, but you know, we don't have the answer to that. It's um, none of these approaches are perfect. And in practice, um, a, lot, a combination of all of these techniques is required. And most of the language models that are coming out uh, more recently are trying to uh, employ a combination of these as well. Okay, so to summarize, we had like three parts. We discussed potential harms the models can cause. We looked into evaluation and detection and uh, how we can use, uh, leverage some of this evaluation detection to try to mitigate um, um, these harms that we described. Um, um, before we conclude and open to questions for which we have no time left at all, <laughs> I just wanna spend a couple of minutes to highlight that in this work, we studied computational methods to mitigate societal harms, but these are not the only angles to look at. People designing these solutions should and must work together uh, with experts in the field of social science and ethics to understand these issues in their systems and how to define and operationalize these issues and think about whether or not uh, computational systems are even necessary in their applications. Uh, in other words, uh, before intervening to remove issues from a system using language models or any other AI solution, we should ask ourselves whether using a technological solution like that is even the right approach at all. Um, so this issue has come up in, in, in machine learning applications many times with people designing systems to predict, say, a person's IQ or their sexuality. There are clearly predictive solutions have no use. Um, and if you're using any such kinds of applications, planning to use, uh, this is a question you should ask yourselves, like, do I need a language model or any other kind of AI solutions for this, for this solution? Um, and with that, um, we thank you. And um, if, if, you, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, everyone. Um, so since we, are, so if you're not aware, um, the slides are already on our website, which is linked uh, in the agenda. Um, but we'll um, update these. So we have updated the slides since we uploaded it last. So we'll update them. And um, if you check them out in a, in a couple of days, uh, they'll be more updated and we'll have a lot more citations that you could check out. Yeah, and, and uh, I want to reiterate that we could, you could also reach out um, to us via email. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Great comments, Oshik. <laughs> okay. Um, so with that, I think uh, we should um, end here, um, since we are basically out of time. Stop the recording.